Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, this past week has been extremely chaotic in the state for some of us, what with the COVID vaccinations becoming available for another uh, population, uh, for the people who are over 75 years of age and those who have co comorbid uh, situations, conditions. It was very confusing to try to figure out how to schedule a vaccination, where to get it, etc 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 steve my husband is a family doc and he cares about his folks and he spends a lot of time trying to help them to do the things they need to do in order for them to not need him quite so much i know that was a confusing sentence but sorry about that anyway he wrote an email and sent it out to each one of his patients telling them that those who are qualified can do this and this and this and this and this, specifically how to do it to get qualified for their vaccinations and how to sign up for them. And also he personally uh, wrote and re recorded and robocalled each of his patients, telling them the same thing, giving them that same information. Three days later, this is the conversation he had with one of his patients. Doc, how come you didn't let me know about this vaccine? I saw a community bulletin that had all the information I needed, and I thought I would get that from you. Uh, excuse me, did you not get the email or the phone call I sent you? Because I had all that information in there. Here, see, your name is on the distribution list for that email, so I know you got it. Well, I don't always pay attention to all that boilerplate that your organization puts out. Well, I wrote every word of that email, and it had the website that you needed in order to sign up for the vaccine. After he backtracked a little bit more, he apologized profusely for having called Steve to criticize him. Listening. It's tough stuff, isn't it? Hard to listen to what we are actually hearing. And there's so much out there. So many voices. So many noises. We don't do a very good job of sifting out, filtering out all the unimportant noises, do we? As evidenced by this very earnest, angry man who absolutely believed Steve had not given him the vital information that he needed and wanted. Well, the right voice had been there all along. He just wasn't listening to it. Let us pray. God, you made our ears, you made our mouths. Please help us learn how to use them in the way that you intended. Open up this message this morning and help us to listen to you carefully and to hear you so that we will understand the message that you have for each one of us. We dedicate this time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Keep her 
here we go. I have a maker. I have a maker. He formed my heart before even time began. My life was in his hands. He knows my name.
everything he says is a life to me. No, I don't want to miss one word you speak. So why am I? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Creator God, Holy Son, we pray to you this morning on behalf of those who are needy, those who are hurting, whether it's financial, emotional, physical, relational, or spiritual. God, you are the God of healing, and we pray that you would inhabit us Inhabit our thoughts, our beings, our situations, and help us to be open to the healing that you have provided for us, the gifts that you have so lavishly and extravagantly given to us. God, we pray for our nation that you would guide and direct the leaders, give them wisdom, move them where you want them to be. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray for our local government, for what is going on with the men and women who are leading and guiding us here where we live. And help us, God, to be a part of your kingdom come, to be the women and men that you want us to be, that you've created us to be. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to the possibilities that lie in front of us and help us to truly be your children, your obedient servants. All these things we pray in the mighty name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a language arts and humanities and social studies teacher, one of the state standards was listening. There are so many of them, but that was just the, the one that was a little bit harder to think about. Just think about that for a minute now. How would you go about teaching listening skills? Well, I have a lot of ideas about that one, but one of the lessons that I used to go about teaching was to play musical pieces and ask my students to write down exactly what it was they were hearing. This was always difficult for some of them because some of them didn't have the vocabulary necessary to write these things down if they hadn't taken any music classes or been in band and orchestra because they wouldn't know the names of the instruments or the melodies or rhythms, or etc. So it was also an exercise in vocabulary or simply an exercise in creatively thinking how to describe something they weren't sure what it really was, just, you know, talking about it. And I would play a specific piece of music. One of my favorites was Camille Saison's uh, Carnival of the Animals. And for those of you who are familiar with it, you know that it's uh, a composite of several tiny or short pieces of music uh, that sound like different animals, such as the elephants, the swan, the tortoises, the hens and roosters, the fast-moving animals, which sounds like galloping. Um, but when I played one particular one, they would always listen carefully until they heard aquarium, which 
just hearing the name of it, you think, okay, fish. But when they heard this particular one, they would all, in, instead of being quiet like they'd been for all of the other pieces, they would start shouting out, Batman! Because a lot of movies will use famous pieces of music as part of the background music. And the aquarium is, has been used in one of the Batman movies. So what was happening at this point? They quit actively listening because they thought they knew the whole story then. Batman! Well, guess what? It wasn't Batman. It was fish. But they didn't know that, so they stopped. It stopped the process of actively listening for them. Active listening. What does that mean? We're going to watch a short video right now. Oh, I don't know. I feel like my parents don't pay attention to me. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm not even there sometimes. Uh-huh. They don't... Mm-hmm. Maybe I have to do something drastic, like dye my hair. Sure. Sounds like a great idea. A huge part about being a good friend or a romantic partner is learning to communicate well with the other person. Being a good listener is more than just allowing the other person to speak. You've got to be able to hear what the other person is saying in order to understand the meaning behind their words. There are a few things you can do to be a good listener. Pay attention. Don't be distracted by things happening around you. Don't get on your phone and start scrolling or texting. Don't judge what the other person tells you. Let them finish their thought without worrying that you will jump to conclusions. Don't spend time thinking about what you're going to say next. This is hard to do if you're feeling defensive, but it will really help if you listen. Show empathy. Empathy means that you show the other person that you feel what they feel. Don't offer solutions to a problem unless you're asked specifically. Most people just want support. They want to be heard. They don't actually want you to solve problems for them. Ask questions to be certain that you understand what the other person is saying, but don't interrupt. Wait until the person pauses. Be responsive. Nod your head or reflect back by saying something like, you must be so excited or that's terrible. Being a good listener is an important skill and can help you to become good boyfriend or girlfriend material. People like to be heard, especially by those they care about. And if you need practice, and don't we all, try it out on your close friends and family members. Oh my gosh, Jim, what have you done to your hair? You really got to talk to me before you do such things. So anyway, till next time, don't forget to visit me at amaze.org or go to my YouTube channel to watch more. Bye. Now, obviously, this is powerful advice for us humans, but our spiritual life also depends on good listening. Let's listen in on a conversation between a young boy and a, a priest. This priest is responsible for the spiritual life of the entire nation. And we hear this conversation in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I will be reading from the Common English Bible. Now the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under Eli. The Lord's word was rare at that time, and visions weren't widely known. One day, Eli, whose eyes had grown so weak he was unable to see, was lying down in his room. God's lamp hadn't gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the Lord's temple, where God's chest was. The Lord called to Samuel, I'm here, he said. Samuel hurried to Eli and said, I'm here, you called me? I didn't call you. Eli replied, go lay down. So he did. Again, the Lord called Samuel. So Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me? I didn't call my son. Eli replied, go lie down. Now Samuel didn't yet know the Lord and the Lord's word hadn't yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up and went to Eli and said, I'm here. You called me? Then Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So Eli said to Samuel, Go and lie down. If he calls you, say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down where he'd been. 
Then the Lord came and stood there, calling just as before, Samuel, Samuel! Samuel said, Speak, your servant is listening. This is the word of God for the people of God. And all God's people said, Thanks be to God. Visions were not common at this time. We just read that in verse 1. So perhaps the priest Eli was not expecting to hear from God. But just because it was rare to hear from God does not mean that it was never. So what do we learn from Samuel and Eli? Eli is a priest. He's the expert. Now, just in case you don't know, in order to become a priest, you have to go through lots of training, years, lots of experience, lots of learning, reading, studying. So I'm not sure what Eli's excuse was. Even though Eli could not see, he was blind, he was an old man, a lot of experience, and he couldn't see anymore, so what could he do? You would think he could pray and listen. Doesn't sound like he was doing much of that, though. It, because he was blind, it would give him much more opportunity to be listening. And Samuel, the child, inexperienced. He was an intern, a novice. He was in the temple to learn from Eli. Question. It is so easy to mistake God's voice for the other voices, the other noises in our lives. What might Samuel have mistaken for God's voice? Or what might Samuel have mistaken God's voice for? It would be difficult, wouldn't it, to hear a strange voice and know immediately what was going on. Type your response into the place for conversation on your Facebook page so we can hear what you're thinking and respond. God did speak to Samuel. If you were counting, it was four times. That God does speak to us is a reality of our faith. The most miraculous, most conspicuous thing in our story is that God does speak to people like you and like me. It's personal. A personal conversation. It's not philosophical discourse or moral commentary. God's major primary form of speech is to individuals, not to groups. I suppose there can be signs in the heavens, will be, we read about that in scripture, or overwhelming events, but when we read our family story, our Holy Bible, when we read it carefully, we see that God makes it personal. Whenever we allow the language of religion or philosophy or argument or grammar or translation crowd out that personal aspect of God to ourselves, we betray the word of God. And to that most personal of words, Samuel listened. That young boy not the priest who should have known better, who should have known more, but that young boy. Listening is an act of personal attentiveness that develops into answering. God's message is not turned into materials for a Bible study or shaped into Sunday school curriculum or set as a topic for an academic paper. Samuel answered which is to say, he prayed. Providing us with a model on how to listen to God's word and how to respond to God in prayer. God had a message. At first, no one was listening. The priest misunderstood. The young boy heard it. God was persistent four times. We don't read that God got frustrated or irritated or angry with Samuel, do we? He just kept calling. The perfect response Samuel gives to God. Here I am. 
He was attentive. He ran to Eli three times. He didn't just say, oh, I dreamed it and went back to sleep. Or think, there's a funny noise, I'm scared. No. He, he was attentive. He tried to figure it out. He was available. He was willing. Where he was, right there in his bed, he said, okay. He did not rely on his own faith or, or, or on his own strength or understanding either. He went to the source of wisdom that he knew, which was the priest. Samuel was still young. He was just learning from Eli. He does not have any personal experience of God yet. However, he obviously knows the history of God's dealing with the nation of Israel because he's living at the shrine the point of faith, the place where everybody would come to worship sometime during the year. And at this time, as we just read in verse 1, because God had not been openly revealing himself to the people, they seemed to have very little interest in what God had to say. At least the priest in charge of the people didn't have much interest in it. He wasn't paying much attention, was he? The five books of the law were kept there in the tabernacle where Eli and Samuel were, but even the priests were neglecting them. Not since the death of Moses had there been a great prophet in Israel. There was a real lack of spiritual leadership at this time. If we were to continue reading this chapter, we would discover that the priest, the one person responsible for the spiritual well-being of the house of the Lord and of the nation, the entire nation, was not prepared to listen to God. Perhaps the one most important thing for him to be doing as the priest, as the keeper of the faith. I think that God spoke to Samuel because Eli had quit listening. He was the priest, responsible So God chose a child. God used a child to further the kingdom. There's no greater judgment than can befall a nation or a people than when it no longer listens or knows God's word. The secret of Samuel's success as a prophet was not that he was a great speaker. We don't really know if he was a good preacher or not or administrator, but we do know he was a great listener. And that child Samuel's response was, speak, I'm listening. The message that is important for us to understand from listening in on this conversation between Eli and God and Samuel is that we must be prepared to actively listen. Listen to God. Most likely, God's message will not be like the one Samuel heard. God is a personal God. It will be different for you than it is for me, than it was for Samuel. What would you most like to hear from God? Are you ready to listen? Read along with me, either silently or out loud, these verses from Psalm 139. Lord, you have examined me. You know me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. Even from far away, you comprehend my plans. You study my traveling and resting. You are thoroughly familiar with all my ways. There isn't a word on my tongue, Lord, that you don't already know completely. You surround me front and back. You put your hand on me. That kind of knowledge is too much for me. It's so high above me, I can't reach it. You are the one who created my innermost parts. You knit me together while I was still in my mother's womb. I give thanks to you that I was marvelously set apart. Your works are wonderful. I know that very well. My bones weren't hidden from you when I was being put together in a secret place, when I was being woven together in the deep parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my embryo, and on your scroll, every day was written that was being formed for me before any one of them had yet happened. God, your plans are incomprehensible to me. Their total number is countless. 
If I tried to count them, they outnumber grains of sand. If I came to the very end, I'd still be with you. This God who knows you so intimately, so personally, loves you and has a message for you. Listen. Listen to the message. And when it comes to listening to God in prayer, let us pause and consider some wise words from Mother Teresa. Prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself in the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depths of our hearts. Too often we come to God with a long list of what we believe God should be doing for us. However, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he began with where we focus our hearts, to God in adoration and worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Only when we have spent some time drawing near to God, lingering in God's presence, can we have perspective on what God might be wanting to say to us. How do we know we're listening to the right voices? Eli the priest didn't know. Well, what voices do you practice listening to? The internet, YouTube, Facebook, Netflix, the news, Pandora, Spotify? None of these voices are inherently bad. But if we allow them to, they can drown out the one voice that we do need to hear. How do you intentionally create space to hear the voice of God speaking into your life? The spiritual disciplines, the blessed subtractions, taking things out, making things quiet, allowing time and space for God, reading God's word. There's just a group of us who are a small group listening to reading uh, a reading plan on a Bible app together and we discuss it a little bit and we hold each other accountable you can do this on your own we've also provided reading plans through our constant contact we can mail them to you you can find one on the internet you can just read your bible by yourself if you don't know how to do it or you want a partner or help contact the office or call somebody on staff. We would be willing to do that to you. This past year, Barbara Ferguson has read the Bible through twice. Mike Hickey's read it. And I know most of your staff has also read the Bible through. Why is that important? Because we're trying to learn how to listen to the one important voice. The one voice we need to be hearing more clearly. Now we're going to pray together in closing a listening prayer. I will be pausing, so don't rush. Read together with me. Heavenly Father, I wait upon you. I pause, still my mind and still my heart. I wait upon you. I stop and listen beyond the everyday. I wait upon you. I rest and allow my soul to have space. I wait upon you, quiet, at rest, held. I wait upon you and call Abba, Abba Father. I know you have searched me, and you know me. I know you are the beginning and the end. I know you are the Redeemer. I wait upon you, allowing your grace to penetrate my whole being. And in this place, close, protected and eternal, I find that this grace renews my strength, wipes away my tears, and promises new hope. I wait upon you. Amen.
this week for the sending. Practice waiting upon God. Find a quiet place. Turn off anything that makes noise or causes you distraction. And just sit there and wait for God. Bring your Bible and your journal if that helps. Waiting and quiet is not something we do very well. We have to practice it. Wait on God, beloved. And now prepare to receive the benediction. A benediction is not an ending. It is a call to enter into the life and work of God. Lord of the noise and of the silence, open our ears and slow our tongues. Make us more available for your purposes. Make our hearts more like yours and make our lives reflect the love you share with us. Amen. Thank you.